We begin with breaking news. Five people from Ontario are dead after their plane crashed last night near Nashville, Tennessee. Good evening. The five people killed include two adults and three children. The U.S. National Transportation Board says it's working with Canadian authorities as it investigates the deadly crash. CTV's Natalie Johnson has been following this story and joins us live with more. Natalie. Well, Nathan, officials in Nashville say that the weather last night was clear when the pilot radioed in that he needed to land. But the plane dropped off the radar as it lost altitude, the pilot saying he knew he wasn't going to make it. In the aftermath of the Monday night crash, officials in Nashville sorted through the rubble on the side of the interstate. The pilot of the single-engine plane had told air traffic controllers that he could see the runway they were clearing for an emergency landing but couldn't get there. The pilot reported a catastrophic engine loss of power or a loss of engine power, a complete loss of engine power. No emergency was declared by the pilot. However, ATC, which was in communications with the pilot, declared an emergency on the pilot's behalf. The airplane had overflown John C. Toon Airport at 2,500 feet and made a U-turn in an attempt to land. Authorities urged the pilot to glide the plane down, but he could not reach the tarmac. His last words on the radio, I'm too far away, I'm not going to make it. The aircraft tumbled, came to rest on the hill behind me and burst into flames. And all five persons on board were fatally injured. Two adults and three children, their identity is still unknown. The question now is what went wrong. We're going to be looking at the human, the machine, the environment. The human being, the pilot, his or her qualification. Officials said to examine who was flying the plane and how many flight hours they had. The wreckage will be reassembled in a Tennessee facility where American aviation authorities will try to piece together what caused the crash that claimed five lives. American transportation authorities say they expect to release their preliminary findings on the cause of the crash in about 10 days' time. Canadian officials now involved in identifying the five people from Ontario who were on board. Reporting live, I'm Natalie Johnson. Nathan, over to you. Thanks, Natalie. Here today seeking the public's assistance in trying to identify who this person is. Police are appealing for information following a grisly discovery on Sherry Beach late last year. They're hoping the public can provide information about human remains which washed ashore. The body parts were found on two different dates in October, but police believe they belong to the same person. Investigators believe the victim was a young man who died shortly before the first set of body parts was discovered back on October 9th. CTV's Beth McDonnell has been following this story. She joins us live with more. Beth. Michelle, police say while the first body parts were found on October 9th, it's believed the man died a day or two before that. And so for far five months, the search has been on to identify him. Along the shore at Cherry Beach, a gruesome discovery has turned into a mystery. Who is the man the body parts found here in the fall belong to? And why, as Toronto police believe, were they intentionally dismembered? We've been working extremely closely with our Homicide and Missing Persons Unit. Uh, both units have been working tirelessly to try and identify who this person is and what actually happened to them. Police say on October 9th, a passerby found a thigh near the water's edge. Officers searched and just meters away found a second thigh. Then weeks later, while on patrol, the Marine unit came across a torso, partially wrapped in a black plastic bag. DNA testing confirmed a match. This is being treated with the highest level of suspicion. At this point, we do not know how this individual died. That is why it is not being treated as a homicide. The insight police need may come from this necklace, found with a size small t-shirt on the torso. Police say the body parts had no distinctive markings or tattoos. With the help of a forensic pathologist, police are releasing a profile. The man is believed to be between 21 and 28 with a light brown complexion, an average to lean build and black body hair, and about five foot six inches tall, give or take a few inches. Other body parts could emerge, says former police officer and forensic anthropologist Greg Olson. They could be all over southern Ontario, actually, depending on the, the uh, methodology of, of whoever did this. Um, it's just a matter of time, Beth. They, they are going to start surfacing. Olson says with the parts found so far and without signs of trauma, police can't confirm how the man died. And oftentimes we find uh, situations where people are kind of caught 
in a drug overdose situation or what have you, and they panic and they want to get rid of the body. And this could very well just be an indignity. The man's identity, critical to move the case forward. This person is a family member, a friend, a coworker, an acquaintance. Uh, someone knows who this individual is. And someone knows what took place. We have members of our population who are vulnerable and they may not have a large network of people who are looking out for them. So if there's someone that you are unaccounted for, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Police say comprehensive searches of national missing person databases to identify the man have been completed. The answer now with someone who knew him. Police have also done extensive video searches of the Cherry Beach area, have worked with partner organizations here and looked in the U.S. They say it's not clear if the body parts were discarded in the Toronto area or further afield. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Beth. Police are investigating a daylight stabbing in East York. Officers were called to the area of Cosburn and Pape Avenue just after 1230 this afternoon. They found a man in his 50s suffering from stab wounds. He was taken to hospital with serious injuries. One person was arrested at the scene. So far, there's been no word on possible charges or the relationship between the suspect and the victim. York Regional Police are asking for your help identifying a suspect after shots were fired at a home in Markham. Investigators released security camera video of the incident on February 28th. It happened outside a home near Castlemore Avenue and Saldus Road. A man wearing a black mask pulls out a gun and opens fire at the home. He then runs off and gets into a black car, which leaves the scene. Police say the house was struck by several bullets. One person was home at the time, but was not hurt. Police are asking anybody with any information to come forward. An investigation is ongoing after two teenagers were struck and killed by an up express train late last night. Police are looking into why the teens aged 14 and 16 were on the tracks near Weston Road and Eglinton Avenue. CTV's Mike Walker joins us live with more details. Mike. Well, Nathan, the up express train was full of passengers on its way to Pearson Airport when it fatally struck the teens. Investigators are trying to determine why the teens were on the tracks. What purpose were they? What was the purpose for them being on the tracks and how they gained access to the tracks? Police canvassing for surveillance video after a 16 year old boy and 14 year old girl were struck and killed by an up express train last night near Weston and Eglinton. It's sad, it's really sad. You wonder what they were doing there, you know? It's not clear why the teens were on the tracks when they were struck by the train around 10 Monday night. Those parts of the investigation haven't been completely uncovered yet. It happened along the corridor between the Bluer and Weston GO stations. Police say more than 200 people were on board the train en route to Pearson Airport. The train's operators immediately called 911. These incidents are traumatic for both the families of the victims and the persons involved in the train. Questions swirling over where the teens access the tracks, which are also used by GO and freight trains, prompting this warning from transit officials. We implore people to stay away from live train tracks. This location is between stations, it's not at a station. Please do not cross open railway lines. Different types of barricades and fencing line the railway. In one area near Black Creek Drive, there is a gap in the fencing. This man says in the past, people would regularly walk along the tracks before construction started on the new Mount Dennis station. In the past years before they started doing the construction, they, uh, there was a lot of kids, even myself, would cut in through there to get further down the street. Um, but ever since they started doing the construction there, they started sealing up the door. I think there's enough barricade there, eh? If there are plans that we can do to make it safer, we will take those under advisement. Service was suspended along the line for several hours while police investigated and resumed this morning. Counseling services are being offered to the train's operators and passengers. Now, police say they've been in contact with the victims' families but will not be releasing their identities. In the meantime, investigators are appealing to anyone with information about the events leading up to this tragedy to come forward. Reporting live, I'm Mike Walker. Back to you. All right, thank you, Mike. A woman is dead after being struck by a vehicle in Oshawa. Durham Regional Police were called to the Bond Street and Centre Street area shortly after 8 this morning. Police say the victim, a 58-year-old woman, was crossing the road when she was struck. She was rushed to hospital where she later died. So far, there's been no word on possible charges in connection with the incident. 
Two tractor trailers and a passenger vehicle were involved in a crash on the 401 in Pickering this afternoon. It happened around 1.30 in westbound lanes at Brock Road. OPP says the three people involved were taken to hospital with minor injuries. The cause of this crash remains under investigation. Alcohol may have been a factor in a collision involving a streetcar in the East End. Police say a car hit another vehicle before crashing into a streetcar on Kingston Road near Dundas. A woman was taken to hospital in serious but stable condition as a result of the crash. Police say the driver of the car is under investigation for impaired driving. And a Toronto man is facing impaired driving and dangerous driving charges after being found asleep behind the wheel. The 34-year-old was found in his car on the 427 near Burnham Thorpe. Police say he had a blood alcohol level more than four times the legal limit and had open liquor in the vehicle. The man had already been charged with impaired driving in the same area. Several children were taken to hospital after a school bus rolled over near Woodstock, east of London. The bus, which was carrying 40 passengers, ended up rolling onto its side in a ditch. One child ended up pinned beneath the vehicle and was airlifted to hospital. Four other children, as well as the bus driver, were also injured. But police say all the injuries are considered minor. More news in a moment, but first, here's a live look at the city tonight. After a lovely start to the day, the rain has arrived. The clouds are looking pretty ominous. Jessica Smith is here with a look at what we're working with this hour. Jessica. Hi, we're looking at a, a cold front, kind of a line of showers along it, bringing rain and the risk of thunderstorms for a good portion of our evening. The good news is on an all-day rain affair. We do see a bit of a break as we approach about 10 p.m., but for now, the rain is carrying us home as we kind of head into the, towards the early part of our evening. Temperature-wise, we're at 8 through London, 5 in Goddard, 12 in Peterborough, 9 in Kingston, 14 in Ottawa. Still very mild, but now is when the winds will start to transition. They were southerly for the most part throughout the day today. We're looking at a northerly wind as we head in towards the evening. So that's when it will start to feel just a little bit cooler. We're not going to dip too far close to the seasonal mark, but we're definitely cooler than we have been as of late. Towards the island right now and through Pearson, we're looking at between 8 and 11 degrees. Temperature-wise, heading through this evening, although it is cooler, we're still above seasonal. Sitting at six degrees, the seasonal norm is minus six. Drizzle continues off and on as we head through the late part of our evening and to start the day tomorrow. Coming up, we'll have a full look at your long range forecast, including when we get the return of sunshine and we'll have a full kind of peek ahead to what you can expect for the rest of the week. But right now, some things back over to Michelle and Nathan. Look forward to it. Thank you, Jess. The Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association has reached a tentative deal with the province. The agreement, which still needs to be ratified, means all of Ontario's teachers unions now have deals in place with the province. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris joins us now with more. Siobhan. Risk is now gone with this new deal in place. Labour disruption in Ontario schools is off the table until after the next election. I'm proud to report to this House that our government has concluded teacher negotiations with the Catholic teachers, meaning all children, two million kids, are in class where they belong. The tentative deal comes after some 20 months of bargaining. The Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, the last of the teachers' unions to get there. They've taken a bit longer than I would have preferred. I'm just pleased that we got this done for families so we keep these kids in school. The union president says this was about getting the right deal, not a fast one. It was all along like the minister wants to just have kids in schools. We want kids to be in good schools. And we felt it was important for us to hang tight and fight for those things. Including better health and safety for staff and students. Resources and supports for students is, is well beyond just the special needs kids now. The average students, all the cutbacks, it's, it's, it's hurting all of them. Not everything's been put to bed. Some money issues will be resolved through arbitration. It certainly wasn't a matter, an outstanding matter at the table. And uh, like many of the other unions that have... Uh, accepted uh, this process. Uh, salary was one of the concerns. The arbitrator will weigh in on wage increases missed while Bill 124 was in effect. OECDA led that legal fight and aims on that case, so you can rest assured it's in our settlement. We won't know all the specifics until OECDA members ratify this deal. On the opposition's wish list... When I start to see uh, teachers, enough teachers in smaller class sizes in our schools, I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. When I start to see educational assistance in our schools able to support our kids who are struggling right now, I'll be happy. OECDA's ratification vote is scheduled for March 26th and 27th. In that same period of time, French teachers will vote on their tentative deal. 
Reporting live from Queens Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. QP is blaming the Ford government for the growing gender pay gap in Ontario. Since the Ford government came into power in 2018, there has been an attack on workers' wages in the broader public sector. More than 90% of the workers in the broader public sector work in education, health care, and social assistance. These are all female-dominated industries, employing 1.2 million women and one-third of all women workers in Ontario. The Ontario Council of Hospital Unions released a report highlighting wage erosion in female-dominated public sector industries. The union claims workers in health care, education and social assistance saw their wages drop by 9% compared to men's wages over the past six years. The report claims government policy is not only affecting women in the workforce, but is also having a negative impact on the quality of public services in Ontario. It's a scheme that could be affecting tens of thousands of Ontarians, homeowners who think they're renting equipment like an air conditioner, but get squeezed for thousands of dollars if they try to sell their homes. The provincial government has been consulting on the issue, but as CTV's John Woodward reports, the opposition NDP today proposed a new law that could make these schemes harder to pull off. They are a shadow of themselves, unable to sleep, eat, Linda Palmieri says her family members in Toronto rented home appliances in 2015 and since then have been relentlessly pursued. Their names and identities have been swapped, sold and essentially trafficked. Hardly the only family whose deals to rent HVAC systems or water softeners turned into nightmares years later. We are seeing rampant abuse of the system. A key tool in a scheme like this is something called a Notice of Security Interest, or NOSI for short. It's like a lien. It serves as collateral when a company installs a fixture in your home. A recent W5 episode showed how often the tool is being abused, where NOCs are registered for multiple times what the fixture is worth. W5 demonstrated how few controls there are on setting up a NOCI, installing a thermostat, and taking steps to secure a NOCI worth 10 times that much without resistance. Hundreds of dollars becomes tens of thousands in many of these cases. Worse yet, homeowners don't even find out about NOCs until they refinance or sell. The NDP is proposing a bill that would prevent more NOCs from being registered for certain products and provide a way to get rid of them without having to go to court. According to the government's own study, 38,000 people received a NOCI in 2022 alone. The NDP bill isn't going anywhere without the support of the PC government, which started its own consultation on this back in October. The only way to fix this problem is to eliminate NOCs altogether going forward and looking back. Amend the legislation in order to wipe noses from the books completely. For victims of these tactics, change can't come soon enough. John Woodward, CTV News. Still to come is Super Tuesday south of the border. One of the most important days on the U.S. political calendar, and it could have a significant impact on the race for the White House. Canada's financial watchdog has been hit by a cyber attack. FinTrack has taken its corporate systems offline as a precaution to protect data. The Financial Intelligence Agency says the incident does not involve its intelligence or classified systems. FinTrack is now working to restore its systems. The agency assists in the detection, prevention and deterrence of illegal activities. As Prime Minister Justin Trudeau faces increased pressure to increase defense spending to meet NATO targets, a new poll indicates Canadians want the military to be well prepared. The Angus Reid survey finds 29% of Canadians say military preparedness and presence on the world stage is a top priority. That's up from 12% a decade ago. Building better trade ties with international partners remains the top priority overall, but that's dropped from 57% down to 43%. Meanwhile, slightly more than half of respondents think Canada should boost military spending to 2% or more, while 30% think it should remain at current levels, which is just under 1.4%. A state funeral will be held later this month for former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. The ceremony will take place on Saturday, March 23rd in Montreal. Prior to that, Mulroney's body will lie in state in Ottawa and lie in repose in Montreal. The government says this will allow Canadians to pay tribute to the late Prime Minister and offer their condolences. 
Mulroney served as Canada's 18th Prime Minister from 1984 to 1993. He died last Thursday at the age of 84 after suffering a fall at his Florida home. Well, it's not just any Tuesday. It's Super Tuesday in the U.S., the biggest voting day of the primary season. Hundreds of delegates in 15 states and one territory are up for grabs, ahead of what's expected to be a November rematch for the White House. CTV's Joy Malvin reports. Donald Trump is having a very good week. The Supreme Court sided with him that states can't kick him off the ballot. Even as he faces 91 criminal charges, Trump is barreling towards the Republican nomination. But clearly annoyed, his rival Nikki Haley still won't drop out. Haley, she's not a problem. Uh, I think she's very negative for the party, but she's not a problem in terms of winning because we're winning by a lot. Haley rallied voters in Texas last night, telling them Trump is a drag on the party and can't win in November. At some point, maybe we should say the reason that America keeps losing is because of Donald Trump. But she doesn't have the numbers to beat him. Hoping to show momentum tonight, the odds are stacked against her. I was actually a registered Democrat, and I switched it to that I could go either way just so I could vote for Nikki. President Joe Biden has won nearly almost all the delegates so far, but a protest vote in Michigan last week over his handling of Israel's war with Hamas is concerning. Well, we need the ceasefire. The hostage deal is in the hands of Hamas right now. His strategy now, defend his policies, get out the vote, and go after Trump, setting up a likely rematch between Biden and Trump, even as polls show most voters just aren't that into them. I think it's disappointing, uh, you know, it's a sort of a, a repeat of, of 2020. Um, I would love to have had some different candidates. I had hoped that Trump would go away. As for Nikki Haley, she says she will stay in the race until after the results tonight. Over the weekend, she would not commit to endorsing Trump, even if he sweeps all of tonight's contests. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. In the Middle East, Palestinian officials say an Israeli airstrike killed at least 17 people in Khan Yunus. The Israeli military said it was carrying out targeted raids on militant infrastructure in the southern city. Gaza's health ministry says 30,631 people have died in the territory since the war began. In Cairo, three days of ceasefire talks have ended without a breakthrough. Hamas said today it insists on a permanent truce and the complete withdrawal of Israeli troops rather than a temporary pause. More desperately needed aid was delivered to northern Gaza today. A joint mission by Jordan and the United States dropped almost 37,000 meals over the largely isolated region. The UN says food entering Gaza is very limited compared to the overwhelming need and that continuing airstrikes and heavy fighting are impeding humanitarian operations. The U.S. says it's looking at both military and commercial options to move aid into Gaza from sea routes, but insists using trucks is best. Back here in Canada, the president of Ecuador is in the nation's capital tonight. Daniel Naboazin was welcomed to Parliament Hill this afternoon by Prime Minister Trudeau. The two leaders were expected to discuss a range of issues, including trade, climate change, and ways to strengthen ties between the two countries. A new group of astronauts has arrived at the International Space Station. The four crew members were welcomed aboard crew today. They're scheduled to remain there until the, the end of August. The crew will conduct about 250 experiments in the microgravity environment of the orbiting outpost. Fearson Airport is preparing for one of the busiest travel weeks of the year. During the busy periods like March break, for example, we're going to have a we have a magician who's in the terminal to, to entertain kids who are waiting, waiting at their gate. Uh, we have a live pianist in the terminal and, and at our uh, at our information desks, we have coloring books for kids. So we're really keeping in mind that the, the passengers who are going to be coming through uh, over the last week, we're going to see an uptick of families so who sometimes are, are not always coming through the airport. And we want to make sure that uh, everybody who comes through over the next week has a really great time. Roughly 140,000 passengers are expected to pass through the airport every day during March break. At peak times, nearly 1,000 flights will take off and land each day at Pearson. Meantime, U.S. Customs are offering tips for those heading south over March break. Always the number one thing is give yourself time. Um, we open up at 3.30 in the morning. 
Uh, so if you have a six, seven o'clock flight, you definitely want to give yourself at least three hours. But um, there are applications, applications that we have installed. It's called MPC, Mobile Passport Control, that uh, you can download through a Google App Store or Android App Store. And uh, it allows you to actually submit your information to us. So it'll make your, your travel a lot more easy. The number of March break travelers at Pearson is up 10% over last year. Coming up, Raptors forward Scotty Barnes has surgery to fix a broken finger. Just ahead, we'll outline the recovery timeline and whether the All-Star can rebound before the season ends. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, co-signing for a loan is a big decision. A woman decided to help her son buy a car and was devastated when he died two weeks later. She was even more surprised to be told she must keep the car even though she doesn't drive. I'll have my reports. That's just ahead. And we saw record-breaking warmth right across the province yesterday. We topped out at 22 degrees in Windsor. Another mild day today, not nearly as warm, but still it's going to make a difference. As we head into the next few days, we do see a cool down. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Buying a vehicle is a major purchase, and depending on your savings and your credit rating, you may need help getting a loan. A woman co-signed a car loan for her son, but shortly after, he died. And now, she's been left in a difficult financial situation. Pat Foran has our story on Consumer Alert. Pat. Nathan and Michelle, a mother from Whitby, wanted to help her son buy a car so he could get back and forth to work. She co-signed a loan for him, but he died two weeks later. Now she's stuck with the car she can't drive because she doesn't have a license. He always made us laugh, no matter what, so. Maria Melville of Whitby is still mourning the loss of her 43-year-old son, James. The elevator mechanic recently had problems with his car and needed a new one. Maria agreed to help with a bank loan. He didn't have the money, so I had to co-sign to help him establish. And I didn't mind doing that. But only two weeks after getting the car, James died of unknown causes. It was a shock because I, I didn't expect that. Not from someone who seemed healthy. Maria co-signed for the 2019 Buick Enclave, which has an amount owing of $24,000. You don't drive and you don't have a license? No, I don't, and I don't drive. So this car is... Just sitting there. Because James died suddenly, Maria approached the dealership and the bank she took the loan out with and asked them to take the car back. Both said no. I'm quite sure they can deal with that, but obviously I don't want to. We reached out to OMVIC, which oversees vehicle sales in Ontario. It said once you sign a contract, it's a legally binding agreement, and that co-signing for a car loan is a big decision. OMVIC said the decision to terminate a contract lies with the discretion of the dealer and the bank. CTV News asked them to take another look at Maria's case. I, I'm willing to negotiate. I'm... I know that I signed papers. The car loan was with National Bank. When contacted by CTV News, a spokesperson said, we spoke with our client and this file is now closed to her satisfaction. The bank agreed to take the car back and forgive the $24,000 loan, which was a great relief for Maria so she can continue to mourn the loss of her son. And I do thank CTV very much what they have done. This has helped me an awful, awful lot. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And you should always remember there is no cooling off period in Ontario when buying a car. There are insurance products you can purchase, such as life insurance, which would pay off a loan in the event of a person's death. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. Have a consumer story idea? Email us at alert at ctv.ca. Well, the day got off to a really sunny start. Clouds have moved in, and there's a bit of rain here and there. A little bit for everyone. If you <laughs> like the rain, we're getting some. It was so mild yeah. earlier. I mean, it's still mild now. It is, but a noticeable change has taken place because of the wind direction. So a northerly wind obviously adds a bit of a bite to the air. So although it is still very mild outside, you'll feel that dampness when you're out there. So if you're a brave person, you want to head out for a walk this evening, you'll just need a layer or two. Uh, keep in mind, though, that we are going to see winds a little breezier as we head into the early evening. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. We got uh, two weather stories today. We had that beautiful sunshine early on today. Temperature still mild. And then we saw that rain, that line of showers move in. 
kind of through the midpoint of our day, really heavier in the last maybe hour or so, and it's going to carry us through the rest of our evening. Temperature-wise, we're still sitting in the double digits, sitting at 12 degrees right now here in the city, 8 through Windsor, 14 in Ottawa, 3 in Wyrington, and anywhere kind of north of Sudbury, you're looking at temperatures in the low kind of positive digits or single digits. Now tonight, although it does cool down, the cold front's going to really kind of push its way past us. We're still going to remain above seasonal. It's just a little cooler in comparison to how warm it was, say, yesterday. We'll be at 6 tonight. We should be at minus 6. Peterborough, you should be at minus 10. You'll be at 3. So, yes, it is cooler, but we're still holding on to those above seasonal temperatures. Down towards, say, London, through Owen Sound, really everywhere across southern Ontario. Although there is a shift, it is still above seasonal. We've seen some of the plants that they're starting to bud a little early because it's been so mild. It could be a little challenging in the coming days as we do see our overnight lows start to dip just a little bit. But heading into the day tomorrow, even though that cold front's going to move its way past us, the majority of that is this evening, we're still watching for drizzle early on for that morning commute and then just a cloudy day ahead of us. But temperature-wise, we should be at 3. We're sitting at 8, the same through London, the same through Niagara, over towards Owen Sound, even up through Bancroft. Everybody remaining mild, even with this cold front kind of passing its way through. There's that line of showers right there. It's going to continue kind of making its way past us with this uh, low that's going to kind of track its way south and then east as we head through the evening. The tail end of this really going to be sitting south of us. High pressure is going to sit in northern Ontario. It will eventually sink its way down. We just have to get through tomorrow first. Still some heavy showers into the early evening, but by about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, the bulk of this will push past us, just drizzle sitting behind it, maybe even a little fog. As we get into the day tomorrow, again, not looking at heavy showers by any means. And then as we get into Wednesday, Evening, that's when the high pressure starts to move its way down, clearing things out. And then by Thursday, lots and lots of sunshine out there. So a beautiful almost end to the week. Now, temperature wise, we saw quite a shift. We were at about 16 degrees on Monday. Today, we got up to about 13. And we get down to about 8 degrees tomorrow. But we're still holding on to these above seasonal temperatures right as we settle in towards kind of the middle of March. Getting into the day on Thursday, despite seeing the sunshine in the morning, it does get considerably cooler in the evening still above seasonal, but as that cloud cover lifts, so does any of the warmth that we had through the overnight. Getting into Friday, a little cloudier, but we will see a few peaks of sunshine, so not a bad end to the week. And then heading into the weekend, another round of active weather on the way, starting as rain and then shifting over towards kind of a little bit of mixing as temperatures are really set to drop as we head in towards our Sunday night. It's also in our clock spring forward, so don't forget. And then as we get in towards a brand new week, we start to rebound just a little bit with those temperatures. Eight degrees on Monday, the mixing will kind of move out really early on. And then by Tuesday, a whole lot of sunshine. So... A very typical spring forecast, we kind of yo-yo back and forth, and that battleground between colder air and warmer air is going to take place. A snowstorm in the long range isn't out of the realm of possibility, but for now, we're just holding on with a whole lot of rain. Michelle, Nathan. Thank you, Jess. Let's talk sports. The Raptors will be looking for a second straight win when they take on the New Orleans Pelicans tonight. Nichich, Gary with the steal. Lays it up and in. The team is coming off a 111-106 win over the Charlotte Hornets on Sunday. Tonight's game against New Orleans is set to get underway at 7.30 at Scotiabank Arena. And Raptors all-star Scotty Barnes has undergone successful surgery to repair a broken bone in his left hand. Barnes suffered the injury during Friday's game against the Golden State Warriors after he was accidentally kicked by teammate Emmanuel Quickly. The timeline for his recovery is six to eight weeks and it's unclear if he'll return to the Raptors lineup before the end of the season. Meanwhile, the Raptors have signed Kelly Olynyk to a two-year contract extension. We got a lot of talent on this team, a lot of young talent that you know, are trying to find their, their way and their niche in this league, like I've said before, and you know, just you know, helping bring my experience, um, you know, versatility to you know, help accent all those pieces and you know, bring them all together. Um, and then you know, some leadership and experience on and off the court. Um, and just helping them grow into, you know, hopefully the, the potential and players that they know they can be. The 32-year-old Toronto native is reportedly going to make around $13 million per season as part of the deal. Olenek was acquired by the Raptors at the trade deadline from the Utah Jazz. He spent his early childhood in Toronto, including playing basketball with the Scarborough Blues. He's also played for the Canadian men's national team for over a decade. Also tonight, a possible measles exposure at a school in York Region. The 21-day plan to protect over 1,700 students and staff and the urgent calls to update vaccinations. 
It's the beginning of March, and Canada has already surpassed the number of measles cases it saw all of last year. Now there is concern as one of the cases is in a person who is fully vaccinated. CTV's health reporter Pauline Chan has the details. Four provinces are now reporting measles cases, one in B.C., one in Saskatchewan, five in Ontario, and ten in Quebec. Of the ten cases around Montreal, only three were linked to travel outside Canada, meaning community spread is involved. Officials there blame waning vaccinations. Meanwhile, Public Health Ontario says all but one of the cases here is travel-related, but the case of a man in his 30s from York Region is believed to be from the community. It certainly is a first in Ontario in some time, although they, they do happen from time to time, and it is something that we're worried about. Dr. Barry Paik says the patient may have exposed others to measles at a school in York Region, so they've notified students, families and staff. We consider everybody in the entire school as exposed to measles because it is so transmissible and we're following up with all those 1,750 students. And the great news is actually this is a good news story that over 95% of those students are actually already uh, immunized. Any students who are not fully immunized with two doses of the MMR vaccine will not be allowed back to the school for 21 days, the incubation period for measles. What makes the case so unusual is that the man was fully vaccinated. While immunizations are um, excellent at preventing uh, illness, nothing is 100%. And the goal, of course, is to limit the ability to, to get sick. And if you do get sick, to, to be less unwell is the other benefit of vaccination. York Region is offering vaccination clinics and phone lines for information. And with March break looming, all travellers, even babies over six months, but who haven't yet received their first dose of MMR vaccine, are urged to get their shots in advance. It takes two weeks for the vaccine to be fully effective. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Meanwhile, officials in Brant County estimate roughly 200 people were exposed to measles after a child returned from Europe, passing through Pearson Airport and two hospital emergency departments. Hamilton Public Health followed up with 100 people relating to the same case. So far, no measles cases have resulted from the exposure and the child has been released from hospital. Just for Laughs has filed for creditor protection and canceled this year's summer festival in Montreal. The company released a statement which says the 2024 edition of the festival will not take place, at least not at the same time and in the same form as it customarily has. Just for Laugh says it's facing a difficult financial situation given changes in the business landscape. Blackberry has taken home a prize from the Toronto Film Critics Association. Picture a cell phone and an email machine all in one thing. There is a free wireless internet signal all across North America, and nobody has figured out how to use it. BlackBerry won the Best Canadian Film Award, which comes with a $50,000 prize. Matt Johnson, who both directed and starred in the movie, says he will use the prize money to help fund his next project. It will be a film version of his Viceland mockumentary series Nirvana, the band, the show. Experiencing the music of Barbie live in Toronto. What do I have to do? You have to go to the real world. Barbie the movie in concert will be at Budweiser stage on August 11th. The film is going to be projected onto a giant screen above the Barbie Land Sinfonetta. It's an all women and majority women of color orchestra. They will perform the movie's award winning score. After the break, the return of home buyers from the sidelines with the February sales and listings reveal about the GTA housing market right now and prices. The airplane passed overhead, made a U-turn and impacted the road, the shoulder behind me between Mongol Marker 201 and 202 on I-40 East. Updating our top stories, five Canadians, including three adults and two children are dead after their plane crashed near Nashville last night. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board is leading an investigation into the crash. If they saw something, if they know something, uh, if the description that we've provided um, rings a bell to anybody as to who they haven't seen in, in some time, to please reach out. Police are appealing to the public for help in identifying human remains that washed ashore at Cherry Beach. The body parts showed up on October 9th and October 30th, and police believe they belong to the same person, described as a man between 21 and 28 years old. 
These incidents are traumatic for both the families of the victims and the persons involved in the train. An investigation is underway after a 16-year-old boy and a 14-year-old girl were struck and killed by an UP Express train last night. The teens were walking on the tracks near Western Road and Eglinton. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. In business, gold prices have hit another record high amid fears that stocks are due to, for a pullback. With more, here's Andrew Bell of BM Bloomberg. Hello there. Gold traded at another new high today, topping $2,141 US an ounce as some investors seek a safe haven amid violence in the Gaza Strip and Ukraine and confrontation between the U.S. and China. TD Securities commodity strategist Ryan McKay says investment funds are betting on bullion, but the rapid move up in the gold price has surprised market watchers. Signs of weakness in U.S. manufacturing also raise concerns about a possible slide in stock markets after the U.S. S&P 500 closed at a record high on Friday. On the markets, the Canadian dollar was at 73.57 U.S. cents, down about one-tenth of a cent. WTI Oil, North America's benchmark, traded at $78.15, down 59 cents. Western Canadian Select, the Alberta benchmark, was at $61.87, down 61 cents. And the TSX Composite ended the day at 21,525.93, down just over five points. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. GTA home sales and new listings were up on both an annual and monthly basis in February. Total sales were up nearly 18 percent compared to the same time last year. The Toronto Regional Real Estate Board says population growth and a resilient economy continue to support the overall demand for housing, but higher borrowing costs kept home sales below a sales record set in February of 2021. The average selling price increased by 1.1 percent to just over $1.1 million. Like over the last year and a half, two years, people have kind of recalibrated what they're looking at in the housing market as a result of higher rates. And so, you know, whereas someone may have wanted to purchase a detached home a year and a half ago, they've kind of taken a step back saying, well, now we're in a higher rate environment. Maybe I'm going to purchase that townhome or semi that comes in at a lower price point and move back into the market, irrespective of higher borrowing costs. But certainly, you know, as we look forward, one of the concerns is that as, as demand picks up, as sales pick up relative to listings, you're going to see more competition between buyers, and that's going to lead to, you know, renewed upward pressure on home prices yeah. as well. Treb says an increasing number of buyers are expected to re-enter the market this year. The founder of Amazon has reclaimed the title of world's richest person. Jeff Bezos has a net worth of about $200 billion. He gained $23 billion in the last year, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Bezos has dethroned Elon Musk, who is worth around $198 billion. He lost about $31 billion in the last year. For the first time, robots are being used to make food deliveries in Japan. Uber Eats is testing a new service on the streets of Tokyo. These robots can reach a speed of nearly five and a half kilometers per hour and stop automatically using their sensors, avoiding collisions with people and obstacles. The company says once the map location is uploaded, the robots can navigate how to get there. But a human operator is always nearby just in case. Meantime, shutting down a major roadway to make sure salamanders can meet up. Just ahead, why the city of Burlington is stopping traffic so these creatures can mate. Tonight, investigating the cause of a tragic plane crash. All I can tell you right now is we have two adults and three minor children. Five Canadians killed in the tragedy near a Nashville highway after a reported loss of engine power. Later on CTV National News. You've seen signs reading deer crossing. What about a salamander crossing? The annual migration of salamanders on King Road in Burlington is now underway. The mild weather has prompted the tiny amphibians to seek out mates earlier in the season. The salamanders are an endangered species and move at night. 
Local officials say closing King Road from North Service Road to Mountain Brow Road is aimed at preventing the animals from being run over by cars. So you still can get a few that are moving during the daytime. Uh, they also will hide under leaf litter that can be on the side of the road or on the road. Um, and those mortalities are a really big deal because if you have continual mortalities of Jefferson salamander year after year, then eventually you won't have a population left to protect. This stretch of King Road will be closed for four weeks to protect the salamanders. Mm, They're doing all they can. Oh, isn't that sweet? And apparently wetter is better for yes. the salamanders, so they should be enjoying this rain. Yeah, the rain is right up their alley, right? As we head into the day tomorrow, a lot of this tapers off, and then the sunshine returns. So if you're not a fan of the wet weather, just wait a few days, and we have a switch taking place. We are looking, though, at showers heavy at times as we get through the rest of the early part of our evening. But really, as we approach 11 p.m., a lot of this will taper off. Still very mild, 12 here in the city, 16 in Welland. We're looking at 14 through Belleville and 13 in Ottawa. The kids will need some of the rain gear early on tomorrow, but likely just a cloudy afternoon ahead of us. Now, we see a cool down and a northerly flow to the winds tomorrow, but we remain above seasonal. Things could get a little chilly as we get into our Thursday night, but overall we settle into the end of the week relatively mild, but there is a soggy weekend ahead, so the salamanders, they'll be pleased. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you, Jess. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night.